Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the 10th um, IU lunch talk uh, that we host monthly. The Independent Evaluation Unit is um, an independent office of the Green Climate Fund, and we report directly to the board of the GCF. We also work uh, very closely with the Secretariat um, to uh, put together evaluation policies, guidelines, standards, and evaluate programs, processes, and performance to then inform uh, not just the board, but also uh, our colleagues at the Secretariat as well as sec uh, our stakeholders outside um, to understand what can work better, what works already, and um, how we can mitigate a lot of the weaknesses um, or potential weaknesses in our programming as well as in our policy. In keeping with that, um, we also encourage new thinking in not just climate change, um, not just environment and development, but also in evaluation and evaluation methodologies. Uh, we host lunch talks every month. Um, we invite speakers from all across the world uh, to talk about areas that are close to their hearts than ours, um, and that have implications for uh, the Green Climate Fund. But as you can imagine, climate change is definitely not a silo subject. Climate change cuts across just about everything that we can think of, right from our own homes to mega cities and to the world in general. In this context, I'm really pleased to have um, Mr. Drazen Kukhan today with us. He is a Senior Urban Development and Energy Efficiency Specialist at the Division of Mitigation and Adaptation at the Green Climate Fund. And clearly one of our very maverick and open thinkers, uh, which is essentially what um, attracted me to invite him to do a lunch talk for us, because we do want people thinking out of the box and we encourage it. We also encourage dialogue around these topics. So just a few words uh, about Drazen first. Drazen leads the urban development and energy efficiency sector at the Division of Mitigation and Adaptation at GCF. He actively engages not just in programming, but also in conceptual work and is building communities of practice on de-risking structures and transformative interventions. He's formerly, uh, he was formerly at the Asian Development Bank um, and was also director for corporate finance and investment banking with the Raffeson Banking Group. Um, he's also been a senior consultant with the European Commission, the World Bank, and UNDP. He's got an MSc in renewable energy and um, an MBA, um, as well as a BA in urban sociology uh, from the University of Zagreb. Um, Drazen will be talking about uh, cities and their potential to be transformative in the context of climate change. Um, I think it's really topical that he's talking about this today, uh, primarily also because we are located in potentially a city that can be transformative, Songdo. Right? Um, and I was reflecting upon this uh, with Drazen just before we started, that when I joined, uh, when I came to Songdo about a year ago, I, I it sort of uh, didn't attract, it didn't, um, it didn't inspire me uh, as much as I, no, it inspires me now. Yeah. There are many, many aspects of Songdo that make it a city of the future, but clearly there's a huge amount of potential that lies untapped. And from Drazen, I think what we're going to hear is not only the challenge of, um, of cities and the fact that, yes, they can, they can really push us in a direction which is very different from the one we want to go into, because they have the potential to emit large, large amounts of greenhouse gases unless uh, they are checked. But because of that, they also hold a huge amount of potential for transformative change. Um, he's going to be talking, uh, so the format of today's lunch talk will be as follows. Drazen will talk for about 15 to 17 minutes. We will then have Arsi Sagar, who will be, uh, who is a Green Cities Analyst from GGI, GGGI's Investment and Policy Solution Division. We're really pleased to have Arsi here today. Um, Arsi will speak as a discussant um, and hopefully will provoke further discussion uh, after Drazen's very provocative talk uh, on, on this topic. Um, so a few words about Arsi. Prior to the Green Growth Institute, 
uh, RC managed projects on urban transformations, climate change, and environment with the Indian Council for Research on International Economic Relations, uh, also called ICRIA in Delhi. And her focus areas of research have been uh, calculating business as usual costs and addressing sustainable municipal financing challenges in India. She's also consulted with international organizations, including the World Bank, and has a master's in environmental management from Harvard University and another master's from Boston University. So with that, we're going to have Brazen talk for about 15 to 17 minutes. Um, then we'll have RC come on for about five to seven minutes that is a discussant. Then um, I'll, I'll essentially put it open to all of you to have as active a discussion as we can. So with that, Grayson, thank, thank you, you and welcome. Thank you. Okay. Let me see speak. All right. Let me, hear, let me see how I can speak. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I should yeah. say that um, this is being uh, um, this is being webcast as well as being recorded. Uh, it will get posted on our website. You're most uh, welcome to also tweet away and put Razor's photograph. Okay, so I, I have to be politically opportune and not say anything? Be politically <laughs> provocative so that we can tweet you. Okay, the, uh, so good, good afternoon, everybody. My name is actually, it's not Drazen, it's Drazen, and it's Kuchan, but it's, um, sorry, you know, sorry. when people approach me, then I usually call them whatever, I'll call you Catherine until you learn how to call my name. You call me Joe, okay? <laughs> you call me Joe. Jo Jim, Jim, right, okay, good. Um, uh, so, so I hope I will provoke a few, few good uh, discussions on, around this topic. So we will discuss a transformative urban puzzle and can cities be climate neutral engines of, of growth? Because essentially climate change will it'll make or break through the cities. Cities are contributing 70% to total energy use, 70% to total GHG emission. But what people do not realize is that we have not fixed cities as we are today. Now, if we're going to have 9 billion people by 2050, the cities as they produce today will cre create 350 gigatons of CO2 additionally for 9 billion people, which would spend about 60% of available carbon budget. That means if we don't fix this problem, there is no way we can keep temperature under 2% degree, 2 degrees Celsius. So that's how serious the problem is, yeah? So, um, you know, um, we often ask if there is a rationale why GCF deals with, with uh, cities in the context of climate change. Um, the kind of the blueprint, the Bible, is actually spelled in UNF C Technical Paper 13, which does refer to integrated cross-sectoral mit mitigation activities in urban areas that illustrates transformational impact. And now I'm not going to read all of this for you, but it does say that we could reduce the city's GHG emission in the core sectors by 24% in 2030 and 47% by 2050. If we do not do that, we cannot control climate change. And of course, time is running out, and you will see that the transformation in cities is actually not happening as quickly as it should. So this is what I already talked about, is that the cities deliver Another thing that people really often do not realize, okay, so cities produce emissions and energy, yeah, but they're also producing the complete output because only cities can actually produce output in a way that we can sustain jobs and inclusivity and social development and economic growth across the world. If we do not have cities, so we have triple dilemma. We have to reduce emission. Uh, uh, we have to keep using energy in a much more efficient way, but we also have to keep uh, producing output and jobs. So it, we cannot just tackle cities, cut everything to be, become green and then lose 40% of jobs because we'll, we'll create hunger. So that's the, the triple dilemma that we really have problems with when, when it comes to the city. And I always quote an example that in fact, because of the urban development just for instance in India, New Delhi on its own by 2030 will be larger economy than the complete economy of Malaysia. So that's how fast the urban development is happening. Yeah, and you know, and when we talk about transformation, we talk about paradigm shifts. You know, we do not see in our project pipeline anything near leapfrogging we need to do and produce to really start tackling these issues. Okay. Of course, cities have to be livable. Cities have to have equity, but we first of all have to have to continue making them productive, but in the same way, completely decouple them from the carbon and energy energy intensity. Yeah. So this is not how we want city to look like, right? We want cities more to be like Songdo. And of course, in a discussion, I'll tell you what I think about Songdo. Songdo is on the right way to go, but it still has a few areas to cover. 
Another thing that you need to sort of keep paying attention is if you look into the core global cities, such as Shanghai, Mumbai, Jakarta, Manila, and so forth, you will actually real, realize that Bangkok on its own is responsible for 71% of the total Thailand GDP, 71% of total Thailand GDP. So you cannot play with a city uh, to make it green a little bit more livable unless you tackle the issue of how economy actually uses the energy sources and emissions to be productive. <coughs> so it's really a core problem. It's a core problem of a structural reform of how we manage resources. And uh, it is a very, very serious problem. Manila is 61% of the total Filipino economy. Yeah? Tokyo of very developed countries, 25% of total economy. So countries are, so not only climate change is making or breaking, but actually countries are making or breaking as to how cities work. Yeah. So we need to properly handle urbanization because our future depends on it. And of course, a uh, number of papers are proving higher temperatures substantially reduce economic growth in poor countries. Yeah. But they have little effect on the rich countries. Because rich countries, like Korea, look at outside, will find a solution, but the poor countries will not, yeah? And higher temperatures appear to reduce growth rates in poor countries much quicker than in, in, in rich countries, and the level of the output. And they have a wide range of effects ac across the agricultural output, industrial output, aggregate investment, and everything related to political stability, okay? So this is why the role of GCF and similar funds and similar instruments is absolutely crucial in trying to make this equilibrium work. Uh, so, how do we decouple GHG emissions from economic growth? And I will, you know, whoever asks me, there are only two or three countries which are actually successfully doing that. That's Norway, that's Denmark, and that's Germany. So, only three countries in the world so far have successfully decoupled emissions from economic growth. And in fact, the Scandinavian model is the only one which is actually working. Okay? So, all economic activities require energy, yeah? To the extent the energy comes from fossil fuels, we'll have emissions. The nature of this link between the growth in economic activity and carbon emission is absolutely critical question to climate change, yeah? And so that, that linkage implies that deep emission reductions will constrain economic growth. So why developing countries do not want to discuss significant transformation? Because they are really afraid that they are going to constrain economic growth and create problems in terms of uh, distribution of wealth, income equality, and of course, eventually hunger. Yeah? And decoupling implies that deep emission reductions are possible with little or no effect on growth. So we have to start teaching these people how do we decouple and still maintain the productivity. One of the ways to look into this is so-called the Kaya identity. And I provided in a previous slide the, the sources for this from literature. So the most instructive tool analyzing the irreversible trend in decoupling is the CHI identity, which establishes the connection between emissions and economic growth. The CHI identity decomposes the linkage between economic growth and carbon emissions in two links. How do we look into energy intensity and how do we look into carbon intensity? Energy intensity declines when we start producing coal, start producing power through coal, and we instead, for instance, look into how to create, uh, sorry, energy intensity, first of all, deals with the energy efficiency issues, yeah? So the best example is Vietnam. Vietnam currently grows at the rate of 9%. Economy of Vietnam grows at the rate of 9% per year, yeah? For that, they're fueling it with a 66% of the power generation coming from coal. 66 of power generation, yeah? Meaning that they have, the more economic growth they produce, the more emissions they're going to produce. Yeah, and if they are not decoupled, that will create significant problems across, across Southeast Asia. Carbon intensity declines, for instance, when we shift from coal to natural gas and so forth, hopefully one day to something even more palatable to, to, the, to, the, um, to the climate, okay? So that, these are the serious, serious, serious issues. And, you know, when you talk to Vietnam, I mean, China has the same issue. It started to tackle, but because of the share size, yeah, we also have uh, something that is, and, and let's not forget, it's not a question of that we need to tackle eventually. We need to tackle under the time pressure. Okay, to maintain, so if you have 100 million people, significant uh, population growth in Vietnam, 24% of total Vietnamese population is younger than 25 years old. That's a tremendous opportunity, but these people need to have jobs, and if jobs are that continue, continue to fuel through coal power generation and energy intensity, is going to collapse sooner or later. So that's the issue between sustainability and economic growth. 
Here, um, we are suggesting uh, how the car identity relationship works in two time periods on the, on the example of world versus United States versus the, uh, versus the People's Republic of China. Uh, what we have shown here in 2008-2015 panel, uh, the United States, for instance, improved energy and carbon intensity sufficiently to enjoy modest economic growth and reduced emissions. But in a contrast, China and the world experienced increased carbon emissions with economic growth. While both carbon and energy intensity improved in China, the improvement is insufficient to reduce the emission over the period of time. The Chinese issue is that China is currently growing, and I'll explain this in the next slide, is China is growing about 6% a year. If they start decoupling emissions, they will start, need to halt grow, growth, and nobody is willing to do that, yeah? Which is the same reason why India behaved the way they behave. So, <laughs> so, and different countries are doing different things, but India, Indonesia, China are all having significant economy based on the coal output, yeah? So in these fractional changes, you'll see that actually carbon, em carbon emissions are growing significantly regardless of, uh, or, so in, in pretty much in a conjunction with GDP, only USA was able to a little bit decouple this. So as I suggested, the only <coughs> positive example of decoupling is either Scandinavia or Germany or to a small certain extent United States, but this is nowhere near enough to meet the targets that were orig originally set up by the uh, President Obama. Yeah. So even U.S. at the current rate of decoupling cannot meet the climate <laughs> targets by 2050. Okay. So I'm, I'm repeating this. Yeah. So uh, <coughs> we showed that the extent of decoupling economic growth emissions depends entirely on reductions in energy and carbon intensity. Entirely. So how do we manage our energy output and how we manage our carbon intensity is the way to the, towards the future. For rapidly growing economies, that means that China, in submission to the Paris Accord, pledged to reduce CO2 emissions per unit of GDP by 60 to 65 percent by 2030 at the annual rate of about 4 percent. But at the current pace, China may well meet this target at the expense of leverage annual economic growth rate of 6 percent, which is simply politically not going to happen. Yeah, so the, the right paradigm shift is not achieved, not, not in China, not in the United States, let alone any other developing country. Okay? And again, I will not read all of this. You can you can have a copy of the presentation later. Yeah. So now I'm making a, a jump. So we, we have now explained how the cities and economic growth are very closely interconnected and how we have to decouple emissions. But the way to, that we actually uh, have to reorganize our outputs and reorganize our economies really relies on structural transformation. Okay? So I'll first explain what the structural transformation is, and then I'll link structural transformation with what we can do to uh, reduce the energy intensity yeah, and, and decarbonize the economy. So the economic growth miracle is sustained for a period of decades, but it has to involve the continual introduction of new goods and not merely continued learning on the fixed set of goods. That means that the economy grows and you have a constant innovation and a cycle that brings new and refresh and innovative products to market. And if you play this game, you're going to be on the top of the game such as Japan, such as Korea, such as United States. If you start to be late in that game, uh, uh, if you do, do not continuously introduce new goods, you're going to actually be tracking, lagging behind economic growth and competitive position of the country itself. So structural change is about the transformation of the economy by transferring resources to higher productivity. Once again, higher productivity is only possible in cities, not in rural settings. So in a higher productivity, we have to diversify production, upgrade exports and production, and constantly increase the labor productivity. I think this is all clear, clear to you. So, and in, in a way to, to monitor this, we can suggest that country needs to constantly adjust its capabilities to compete through a structural change. And this structural change in a position relative to other countries can be looked into assessed in a pro product space. Now the product space is just a graphical example that explains how well certain industries are positioned in a country. And what you have here is an example, when you have a lot of these dots together, that means the concentration is high and relative productivity of that specific industry is strong. Yeah? The more the dispersed, diverse, uh, dispersed um, these bullets are, then you actually see that actually you don't have a coherent economic or industrial policy that will allow product space to function for the country. Yeah? So it's an application of the network theory that yields a graphical representation of all products 
and it shows the proximity of all products to each other. So if you look, then you can monitor the, I don't know, textile industry for the whole world. You can monitor the steel industry for the whole world, and you will then see where, where each country is are relative to each other in terms of proximity of what, do, what they, would they have as the unique uh, competitive um, uh, portfolio that can really compete in a specific industry. So we actually understand when we look into developing countries how far they are to compete with, with the developed countries. Yeah? So we have to look into capabilities and capacities of countries. Yeah? Um, I'm sorry, Raz, yeah, could you ahead. explain sure. this the diagram that you have? So yeah. there are blue dots, right. and um, I'm assuming that means uh, greater than 0 0.55 intensity of, of proximity. Right, exactly. But proximity to what? Uh, proxi uh, it's a proximity. To, so the, it's a, it's a, the node size is actually the world trade, okay. right? So when you look into the specific proximity to the competitive parameters of the specific industry according to the world trade. So if you monitor a country, the side of the node really explains whether you're close or whether you're periphery or closer to the center in competing in oil, in cereals, in forest products, in mining and so forth. It's a really good graphical example to, to explain when you look into Bangladesh, you know, you look into the Bangladesh textile industry and then in certain parameters they're very close to the center of proximity and in certain parameters not. And that really determines your industrial policy strategy, how you should compete in a specific sector. Yeah? Gives you a relative position of the economy versus the other economies. Yeah? So the nodal centers are the world trade and the link core is proximity to the core of the world trade in a specific center. Yeah? There is, a, I mean, the whole literature behind this. Yeah? So, yeah. so. Right. Each one of these nodes is yes. the capital intensity of, of the industry. Yes, yes, and, and a core, core, core capacities and kind of competitive strength you need to be as a country to really compete on a global scale in terms of world trade, yes. Exactly. So it's indexed to world trade. It is indexed to world trade, yes. Yeah. I mean, the product space is very well explained in literature. You can just dig in and there are a lot of literature explaining this. And I, I do want to divert from my core topic, but this is a very good example to explain to you because we are saying, look, cities are productive, right? Cities emit, yeah? To change the output structure, you need to have a structural change and that is visible in the product space, yeah? So in fact, products, the way we organize product space can be very output oriented and can be good for the country, but if it's also emission carbon intensive, it's going to destroy the climate. So in a way, you cannot just continue to compete only by thinking of product space. You have to continue thinking about how you organize your outputs and whether you can really decouple them to continue to be uh, competitive. Yeah? So there's nothing in this product <laughs> space that actually shows you how energy intensive no, that industry is. No, no. Okay. This, is this is purely from okay. economic growth perspective, yeah? Okay. Again, there is a lot of literature, and we could have a separate discussion on this for two hours, yeah? Okay, so just keep that in mind, because it's about, if you look into this, it is about how do you organize capabilities of countries to continue producing output, right? But in the same way, that output has to be produced through cities that have to be carbon neutral. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. So, so the developing countries are keen to learn what policy intervention will lead to a further structural change, which means changes in the output and employment structure, focusing primarily on cities as engines of growth. Yeah, but reductions in energy and carbon intensity do not always count as a productive growth strategy. Yeah? So we have developing countries only thinking about this picture without thinking about what carbonization and emissions we're going to create for their, their country. So these structural changes uh, cannot happen anymore in a business as usual fashion, and we have to start thinking about de decarbonizing them, making them green, and emission-free, yeah? So, in the same time, we have to develop capabilities and we have to develop resilience to, uh, to emission and carbonization, okay? So, in a way, we are achieving this in cities by pushing for significant energy efficiency interventions, sustainable transportation interventions, and low-carbon urban services, water, wastewater, waste management, um, greening of the city, and so forth, and a whole set of holistic strategies cities can employ in their urban planning to become far more decarbonizing. Um, and again, that's a topic on its own. So in the appendix, um, I would just like to say that if you look for a brief history of economic transition from low to high income, um, that, that, that type of work implies that uh, countries take about 50 years to move from the, let's say, low to middle income 
to about high income strategies. So there is a future for each of developing country and they can really grow from low to high income by creating a continuous structural reform. But we also now argue that we also have to decouple their growth from emissions decarbonization. And I open the floor for discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jason. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Pretty good. Uh, so now we have Arsi, um, hopefully giving us a somewhat uh, more positive <laughs> view of the world and possibilities. Yeah, thank you so much, Drazen. Um I think this is very informative for even someone like me who, when I look at your presentation, I well, first let me start off by saying thank you for giving me this opportunity. I completely agree with everything that you've said, that this is the problem that we're facing. And this is precisely the conversations that we have with governments when we go out and talk in the field with cities, with national governments. So I think I look at it more from an implementation perspective that given that this is the problem, how do we localize it? How do we get people to understand that we're racing against time, especially to be able to reach that 1.5 degree? For instance, I'll let you know we're working in, in the Pacific Islands and now countries are trying to look at, well, how do we reach the 1.5 degrees target? But then what's the contribution of cities to this target? I think that piece is missing, that understanding is missing. So I think there's, there's a lot of, we understand at the global level, but then how do we bring it down to the city level? So just a couple of thoughts and comments and I'll, I'll open it up and I'll let you respond to this. I think a um, couple of things that we've seen also precisely what you've mentioned because the rate of urbanization is so rapid at this point, we're finding that it's not just the primary cities that are already reaching some sort of a capacity in terms of the density levels that we're seeing that sprawl. But what about when secondary cities start developing? Where's the opportunity for them? Do they leapfrog? Do they follow the same business as usual pathway of urbanization? What's the learning for them there? Then it also brings up the question of technology transfer that everybody's been talking about. How do we share that technology from high income to middle income to low income countries? Um, is there a way that we can do that? A lot of times cities come to us and ask, um, we don't even have the plans in place. How do we implement something like this? We don't know what climate change means. Um, my first conversation with, with somebody in one of the low income countries, I said, do you understand what green growth is? Do you understand what NDCs are? And the mayor of the city comes back and says, oh yes, we have plans for putting up trees in our municipality the next year. Mm -hmm. And I could see that if you try and talk to them about this, they start <laughs> visibly getting frustrated. So I stopped the conversation right there. But that precisely tells you the lack of understanding. So forget 1.5 degrees, like where do you even start as practitioners? So I think these are a few questions that come up and you know, maybe if you can answer that. And the last question that I have is, and this is something that I think everybody's struggling with, is how do you finance this, right? So we understand this. Just here. Right? <laughs> exactly. Well, we have the fun here. Right. But right, exactly, because cities are not exactly, they're not, they don't have the means to borrow money on their own, right? So what are some of the funding mechanisms that we could put in place to address these? Right? <laughs> I know we have only two minutes or a few and, minutes. And my next speech will be a Nobel Prize acceptance, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, first of all, another example uh, that we should work more with GGI, yeah, because I think some of the colleagues have phenomenal intellectual potential, and I think these are very, very valid questions that I'll try to answer. So, so I think we have to be much more appreciative of GGI in general. Um, I, you know, there are no right, right or wrong answers. Um, one, one dilemma that is always interesting is, in fact, we should be aiming for more densification of the cities rather than su suggesting sprawls. I'll tell you why, because when the cities are dense, they can be better organized, and you have a much better ratio between energy efficiency and sustainable transportation and overall emission, because you have more people. If you combine, if, you, if there is a proper land use and integrated urban planning with a mixed zone development, you are combining businesses and residential and green areas in a way that they have optimal relationship. And you can manage that much better because you have economies of scale and economies of scope. So in fact, then densification, if it's managed properly, it's not a bad thing. In fact, densification is the only answer to the big cities. Okay, so that's a, that's the first, first issue to say. Second issue is that, of course, secondary cities are phenomenally important. And what you are going to have 
if the growth of the organization is properly managed, you're going to have a polycentric growth where you are starting to decentralize big cities. Because if you have a huge city of 10 million or 20 million people and they depend on only on one market or one central area, you'll have, first of all, disparity, you'll have social inequality, and you will eventually have crime. So what you do is you make sure that as soon as there is a certain level of growth achieved, you start developing polycentric areas. So the secondary cities close to the bigger cities are slowly um, kind of merge together in a suburbia area, which then functions as in American concept where you sleep in suburbia and work in the center or, but you, there has to be a equal growth, polycentric growth where you really manage the resources and organizational space in an optimal way so that you achieve densification. Yeah, I will just give you an example. Mexico City, there, there is a pilot by GIZ in the Mexico City where they looked into how they can combine interventions in energy efficiency and sustainable transportation in highly dense areas. The initial estimations are suggesting that when you're improving the public building together with the sustainable transportation efficiency in Mexico City, you reach 35% uh, less GHG emissions, 35% less GHG emissions. So that's the way to go. Yeah, because then you, again, you have then ability to, to organize things. I'll just say as an example, 30% of total emissions in cities are coming from public buildings. 25% of total emissions are coming from the way we heat water. So imagine that we only are able to achieve the way, the different way that we actually heat water for our personal use, we would reduce 25% of the total problem. Which means that, you know, problems are in our head and they are behavioral above all. And that's why we are saying we are not achieving nowhere enough. And that's why, why transformations are not deep enough because, you know, we are not able to raise even the level of consciousness about that. Yeah? So maybe okay. then I can ask yes. you a little bit more about that. that <coughs> how do we, I know there's a lot of, and there's been Nobel Prizes uh, being won on nudge economics, and mm -hmm. that's a buzzword that's coming up these days, then how do we get people to, to start changing their behavior? For instance, I'll give you an example. We're looking at, again, uh, the Pacific and we're trying to, or actually this could apply anywhere really, but we're trying to get people to understand the, the problem of waste, right? Now we all, we, we all know how it works in Korea. It's very segregated. We, just, we, don't, we have limited trash cans outside, right? So when I first moved here, it was a big, um, we were actually quite surprised to see a few colleagues and I thought, how come there's no trash can? So we did a little experiment. We walked out in Seoul and we, we tried to walk a mile and say, how many trash cans do I come across? And it's very few. That's because people realize that you don't just throw it anywhere. But the minute we go out into some of the smaller cities, we say, well, what do you do with waste? It's either dumped out somewhere that's like, it's not my problem, the whole NIMBY concept, not in my backyard. It's, it's my problem until it's in my house, but the minute it's out, it's not my problem, it's the government's problem. So we said, well, where does it go? It goes to the landfill. Well, do you look at segregation? Do you look at composting? Do you realize that there might be a value to waste? And then we say, yeah, there is, but segregating it is not my problem, right? So it says, well, who's going to do the segregation then? Do you realize it could probably create opportunities out of that? So when we, when we spoke to the mayors and said, do you think there's a willingness for people to segregate their, their waste? They come back and said, um, yeah, well, you know, that's, you're, that's a losing battle for us. So that's what I want to know, how to tackle something like that. That's so fundamental. Mm -hmm. Right, to change people's behavior. Sure, sure. I think it, um, I think it uh, requires intervention in the regulatory affairs of right. the city, right? Because, the, I mean, essentially, uh, one of the ways to improve cities is to look into material flows. And this is all about cycle economy, right? So if you, I mean, I always remember in Amsterdam, I only made one mistake with my waste. And so I brought it to the street for collection two hours early. Yeah, and I was fined 100 euros for that. <laughs> So I brought my properly, so I bought a special bag which cost 10 euro for my waste, properly segregated. And the only thing is I brought it two hours early and I paid 100 euros, right? So that's Amsterdam, right? Um, as soon as the government starts treating the urban economy as the material flow economy, with, with properly, which properly evaluates issues of land use, ecosystems, right? 
and then we look into the waste as, as a resource rather than as, a, as something we have to get rid of, things will work out. Uh, but of course, that's much more easier and said and done in Switzerland. A little bit touch difficult to do it in New Delhi or Jakarta, right? Yeah. But I mean, it has to be, it's a combination of intervention and you change of behavior because when you provide incentives and information, right? So incentives are maybe you create informal economy around this, maybe you create a, a communication strategy around this and you slowly change a, uh, regulatory incentives and um, uh, legal reform around this, so that people start understanding what the, the true value is. Yeah, and but you, I didn't answer your question on financing. Yeah, uh, very interesting for cities. <clears throat> Essentially, cities are difficult to finance because they're all subnational players, and subnational players have issues with raising finance. Um, there, there are two or three ways around this. Uh, one is that the countries should decentralize the way they're organizing their finance, and cities should become uh, rated in capital markets and started to apply for their own projects. Secondly, is um, there has to be a much bigger and better variety of financial instruments, such as we're already doing in GCF, where you provide a guarantee or first loss guarantee or some form of guarantee or insurance instrument that help enables the viability gap uh, for the cities to really borrow money and, and do their own projects. And thirdly, overall, is that um, sadly, um, we need about uh, 350 to 400 billion. We need about almost a trillion of climate finance flows uh, on a yearly basis to really achieve the two, two, two degrees reduction target. And we are short about 500 billion every year. So unless world really comes up with the money we need, uh, uh, we are not going to be able to actually uh, shorten the gap. Thank you, Drazen and uh, RC. Um, so I'm going to use moderator's privilege and also present a few questions to you, Drazen, and okay. perhaps to RC as well. First was, um, I, I thought, uh, you know, your uh, typology of countries and how uh, you gave us some examples of Norway, Germany, one of those Scandinavian so, countries. Denmark. Denmark, well, thank you. Yeah. And the United States and how they were succeeding in decoupling um, how they had succeeded, at least three of them had succeeded in decoupling, but one, uh, the United States, at, at the threat of, um, you know, political peril, they were still going forward with decoupling. And I think I'm going to sort of wear my developing country hats and, um, and ask you the, the more provocative question. Given that there are clear trade-offs uh, between decoupling and growth, which you uh, very clearly pointed out, how are you going to convince developing countries to do this? Um, and it sort of speaks to RC's question on, um, on incentives, because you're speaking about incentives at the grassroots level, but it's also true that you need these incentives at, um, at the global level as well. And the second <laughs> comment that I had, so RC, to okay, speak I'm not to off the hook yet. Okay. Yeah. yeah, well, it's actually for RC, and you know, there's quite a bit of behavioral uh, insights work that's been done on individual behavior change. So uh, behavioral insights units in Singapore looked at putting monitors and showers, and as soon as you put monitors and showers, it's not um, you reduce the consumption of water for showers. So just the fact that you're putting it there, not that it's actually measuring how much you put. Yeah, how much you're sharing. Um, the second is creating norms. So machines, you know, have um, calibrated energy consumption usage and they compare it with other machines as well. And that changes uh, how people purchase machines. But it's clear that you have to create these norms around energy efficiency and what is good and what is luxury. Um, that then creates that kind of demand. So it's essentially a question of creating demand, supply creating that demand rather than the other way around. But I know that, yeah, you know, for example, there's this entire paradigm of, of mind space, which is an acronym which stands for measure, incentives, norms, uh, salience, um, et cetera, that you can actually bring about changes at behavior. But I, I agree that at the city, at the household level, you do need to embrace insi behavioral insights to bring about changes in behavior. But, Drazen, so any ideas around that, um, around those kind of solutions, and is GCF doing anything in that space? 
Thank you. Okay. Um, very interesting question on developing countries. In fact, uh, there has been recently quite a few nice OECD reports who are suggesting exactly that. The, you see the green economy is actually an opportunity, not a threat. Because with the right approach to structural reforms and the way to organize your resources, the green economy is actually not going to take jobs away, they're going to incre increase the jobs, right? So if it's properly approached, the paradigm of green economy is just going to be an additional opportunity. And no matter what, where you are, um, essentially with the green economy, you will uh, reduce the cost to environment, you're going to increase eventually the productivity, and you're going to start thinking much more greener, and essentially in 99% of the cases, the green economy is an opportunity, not a threat. But because of lack of knowledge, and because of lack of structural reforms and political courage, and also because of the short election cycles, most of the people do not see that very clearly. And so you need to be really a leader of a country with a good vision to suggest that the green economy is actually a huge opportunity. So that's where the hope lies, right? Okay. On your second question, <laughs> on your second question, um, uh, look, uh, you know what is funny? I mean, uh, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, this goes into the domain of cultures because different cultures treat resources differently. And, you know, it's much more German to be very cost saving about the water than it is, I don't know, Slavic or it's Indian or whatever it is. Uh, but I think we, we have a ways around it, um, and it comes from three elements. It comes from the price resource, comes from the regulatory mechanisms, it comes from the, again, increasing, constantly increasing awareness, because if people are not stupid, yeah? So if you have, um, let's say, if you have, uh, you know, the magic boundary for water use per capita is about 170 to 200 liters per person, right? If you have, bring, the, bring this barrier down to 150, which is still a very decent amount, and you say anything about 150 per capita, it's going to be excessively expensive. That's one, one way to start looking into it. Second way is that you have a regulatory reform, which then suggests that, um, you know, uh, you can actually start cross-subsidizing uh, big users of water with the smaller users of water and kind of optimize the use of water and energy or any other material across the entire portfolio of customers. So you can do that, and of course, private sector is doing that much better than the public sector, but there are ways that you can actually constantly optimize portfolio and really come, to, come up with kind of a smart way to use energy, smart ways to use water, essentially smart digitalization way of cities, but also of uh, personal consumer patterns is a way to go because you will eventually be monitor to digitalization, and you'll eventually come up to a much more sustainable pattern. The question is only how quickly we can do that, yeah? And thirdly, whether the GCF is doing enough, I do not think so, yeah? And I think that uh, when we are discussing transformation and paradigm projects, we are far too often accepting plain vanilla in the place of a very, very great projects. But in, in the same time, we have to say that out of the 50 accredited entities, uh, that we are where we are receiving projects, we have not seen too much innovation coming our way. Mm. So maybe the way forward would be to discuss how we can encourage innovation and whether we would have a specific fund or specific incentives for accredited entities and our partners to be, start becoming a little bit more innovative. You know, people are not stupid. Yeah, it's just a question of of the right pathway, the right incentive, the right encouragement. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. Okay, so now I'm going to open it up to the room. Uh, so Lalana. So we'll do three questions at a time so that the speakers have a little bit of uh, time to also think about their responses. But Lalana, go ahead. Uh, if you could come to a mic. Oh, thank you, Dustin. Okay. Uh, we're recording it, so oh. best if you use a mic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Dustin. That's very, very exciting, very interesting. Um, in one, I think the slide before the last one, you had a title which included, uh, there you go, that, that next step one. Uh, you, you have governance up there. Right. I didn't quite see a point on governance um, in the list there. Maybe could you expand a little bit on the importance of governance? Because after all, these are the decision makers, uh, you know, uh, come from uh, the aspects of governance. And none of these regulatory frameworks and say incentives that you spoke about are going to happen unless there are somewhat maybe uh, deep governance changes, particularly at the city level. Um, maybe you could speak a little bit more about that and also maybe give us some illustrations if you have any that uh, explain. Thank you. Thank you. 
Two more Anyone questions. else? Yeah. Sana. I was very um, uh, interested in what you were saying about that, um, you know, the we need to the densification of cities. Um, and I know that a lot of a lot of cities or a lot of governments are trying to create incentives so that people don't move to the capital. They want to maybe develop another area of the country. Mm -hmm. How do you see that? Do you think that that's a way forward at all, or or should it, should it should governments allow citizens to just continue to go to the same cities? Um, and whether, like, particularly when, when it comes to climate change, what the impact would be uh, of that. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, they're, they're thinking of that question. They're, they're thinking? Respond. Okay, good, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, Laura, um, the, the best way, to, of course, the best theoretical way to move forward in terms of climate change in governance is that we, we start really looking into the performance-based measurements for any government, especially city government, that is certainly happening maybe in a advanced American cities or advanced European cities where if the, the, the city mayors and the local government does not manage uh, the material resources in, in a way of cycle economy, and they, are, they are creating, you know, there are examples, examples of cities, especially in Germany, where they have completely decoupled from the public utility and they have created their own utility, right? That means that the mayor is really responsible and they have created citizens who are shareholders of their own utility and they have a renewable energy and waste uh, waste to energy recycling where they actually manage and even profit from their from their own uh, municipal economy so that's the way forward but of course i mean germany is one thing and i don't know sri lanka is another thing or whatever i mean uh, paraguay is another thing and so forth right so the it is the question of uh, parallel de de democratization process with the performance incentives where they you somehow the public uh, public opinion should start pushing the stakeholders and the, and, the, and the governments towards being much more accountable for what they are doing in a way that it has to be self-sustained, decarbonized, and, and uh, highly energy efficient. Because this is the way forward. And there are, you know, I always, what gives me hope is that you have up actually cases across the world where you see that the governments, specifically for smaller cities, have taken uh, matters in their own hands. So it is possible to decouple from the main system, to become to become and stay decentralized and start managing your own material flows in a way that is sustainable. And that is the way forward. Now, how do we achieve that in, in a more complex political situation is a different story. But I think, um, uh, you know, we are here, uh, GCF and instruments such as GCF are here to really intervene in developing economies. And I think this should be and become one of the biggest biggest area of intervention that GCF is proposing to developing countries. It's one thing. Second, second question is interesting, but it's also very illustrative because I think we are mixing apples and oranges and I'll explain why. It is not about moving to the, city, to the capital city. So first of all, the growth of urban areas has to, has to happen in a polycentric way. So when you have cities which are in a 50 kilometer radius from the capital city, they have to be start slowly being integrated into that specific urban growth and benefiting from urban economy. So instead of those people moving into the city center, you will have a polycentric area of growth. But once you have so many people in one area, then you have to densify. So it's chicken or egg, right? It's not, we need more people in the capital city. No, we first of all need to have e equilibrium and polycentric area of growth that really starts to logically and organically uh, expand the very large urban areas. And once we have achieved that, then a densification should happen to achieve economies of scale and scope, right? So it's all, it's, the densification is more about the equity than it is about bringing more people to the capital. So it's a question of how do we organize ur ur urban growth and economic and e equal growth within a city, city premises. So that's, that's a kind of a maybe wrongly tuned question. Yeah. Did you have a follow-up, Susanna? Anyone else? Yes, yeah, so Just to respond uh, to your question on asking about governance, maybe one thing that we're finding in the recent past is China's ban on importing waste into its mm. borders, right? Yeah. So what we're finding is all of a sudden it's been a huge trigger in countries trying to deal with their own waste. So systems that weren't in place, now there's a huge incentive to put that up because it's piling up. So we're now finding countries increasingly paying attention. So maybe that's a policy trigger that gets people to change their behavior and having to deal with their issues within their borders rather than exporting it. Uh, 
I think that's that's a great example. My 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 challenge, I think, for governance uh, is talk about China and the decision making processes there. Sure. There is an incentive to make the decision maker understand what's good. And it's a question of making the decision. The democratic system, particularly the young democracy, we're looking for. It's a much more difficult question because they are there on three or five year cycle and, they, and, and those are not, they actually disincentives uh, to be, you know, to coming to be elected uh, as against the incentives, kinds of incentives in that case. There's real tension there. And I'm not sure any of us, or even the famous governance experts, really have answers to this. That's, that's a huge challenge. This is your Nobel Prize opportunity. Then. Right. <laughs> I'll work on it. Yeah, thank you, Razan. It was uh, very insightful. Uh, I was just wanting to follow up on one of the statements that you, you, you made. Uh, it's about the highest productivity that takes place in actually urban settings. Uh, could it be that it's because rural areas do not have uh, the same adequate level of infrastructure that uh, urban areas are having and thus uh, maybe to tackle the problem we should also look into more investments also in rural areas. Okay. It is of course because uh, more economic value added uh, requires more infrastructure there's no question about it but it's also organization of labor and output yeah and I think it's again it's a little bit different it's a little bit wrongly tuned question because I do not argue that you know we should just have cities as our ivory towers and then we'll just forget about rural no we we develop uh, cities as polycentric areas of growth and as city grow they kind of encompass more and more area and they take smaller cities and even urban, uh, rural areas eventually under the urban area but in r rural areas have different priorities rural areas have to be able to produce enough food in an effective way and environmental friendly way to feed us all. So I'm not excluding rural areas, just in a question of urbanization, the way we organize urbanization cannot be exclusive. It has to be inclusive and equal and polycentric so that you know the way the cities grow do not stop rural areas from developing. But it is a question of organization of output and infrastructure, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thanks both for your comments. Um, so another question more related to the rate of change, because you're talking about my examples on China and the rate of their changing from coal to renewables, um, they are, by 2030 they're going to have roughly about $90 billion of um, infrastructure that will be useless. And so if they were to change any more, it would be untenable. Even at this rate, it's probably untenable. So how do you sort of suggest we incentivize those changes and get those losses? Hmm. Um, at the moment, the way China mitigates these losses is that it is exporting its coal and coal power generation to Africa. So they have actually started to clean, clean up the problem at home and they have created a problem somewhere else. So that's what is currently going on. And that's a little bit of a political game of, of, of China and the climate change. And, you know, we cannot influence global politics, but uh, I think that the way to make a green economy sustainable is simply you need to start finding completely replacing the way we have actually we actually using our resources and we actually create a new economy. So I think that uh, the further innovation and further improvement of the greening of infrastructure will create such a significant growth opportunity that it will not matter that part of the old infrastructure is not normally used. So I think that. Uh, uh, what we are aiming is that uh, the modernization rate will be such that that type of uh, problems will actually be negligent, negligent in the near future, provided you do not export anything to Africa. Yeah. Thank you so much, Razan, and thank you so much, Arti. Really, really appreciate both of you taking the time and uh, engaging with all of us. And uh, I'm really hoping, of course, that um, GCF Secretariat engages much more with GGGI. Um, and we're hoping that this will help to facilitate. Uh, we're definitely, the IEU is definitely speaking quite a bit with GGGI and we're hoping to develop that relationship further. So with that, I'm gonna try and close this lunch session uh, with the announcement that our next talk, the 11th talk, IEU talk will be on the 30th of April. Um, and our next speaker will be David Moulton, who is the director